All right, we are ready to get started here. Uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, and welcome to the American Indian and Alaska Native Behavioral Health Webinar Series. I'm Kate Trams, and today we have Bob Rarit, uh, who will be instructing us on ethical considerations in substance abuse treatment of Native clients. This training series is brought to you by the National American Indian and Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center. We are part of the ATTC network, which also includes 10 regional centers and a net network coordinating office. To learn more, please visit our website. Our center is a NADAC certified educational provider, and we'd be happy to, pro to provide you with CEUs for a $15 fee. The CEU request form is available for download in the files pod in the webinar screen, and we will also be sending this out in an email to all who attended. Immediately following today's webinar, you will be redirected to our GIPRA evaluation. SAMHSA, our funder, asks us to evaluate our events in order to provide improved performance assessment and accountability. This survey asks about your satisfaction with the event and will take less than 10 minutes to complete. We thank you in advance for helping us to improve our programs. You will be muted for the duration of this webinar, so please use the Q&A and chat pods to share your questions and comments, and we will address your questions as appropriate, at appropriate points during the presentation. The Q&A pod is, is a place where you can submit questions anonymously, and we will not share your name um, if, if you would like us to not do so. And But the chat pod, um, just so you know, your name will show up, the name that you in <coughs> So just be aware that if you write something in the chat pod, it will show who it was from. Uh, today's speaker is Robert Rarit. Um, we also call him Bob. He's a, a dear friend and coworker of ours and has been working in the addictions field, addictions treatment field for over 20 years. He is currently serving as the administrative manager of behavioral health for Hennepin County in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and is also a consultant for our ATTC, as well as an expert trainer. Uh, I'm really excited because um, I love hearing Bob share um, about, about ethics and responsibilities um, because it, it's, it's, it's often hard things to hear. It's often um, situations that are tough to go through, but um, Bob has great experience in dealing with and being an advocate for his clients, and I'm just so glad that we have him here to, to speak on this topic. So I'm going to hand things over to you, Bob, and thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks very much, Kate. I appreciate the, the warm welcome, and hello, everybody. Um, let me start off by saying I understand that the uh, title of the webinar um, might give you the impression that this was going to be specific to uh, ethics and Native American culture, Alaska Native culture. Um, previously, when we did this presentation, I did it with Sean Baer, and obviously Sean was more of an expert with uh, ethical considerations as they pertain to Native communities. So what I tried to do since I'm doing this solo today is to focus on um, two things. Privacy law that um, I'll give an overview of the 42 CFR part two, and then how privacy law and ethical dilemmas can uh, sometimes collide. My hope was is that without uh, stepping outside of my scope of knowledge too much, was to um, come to you with a kind of a unique, I hope, presentation that applies across cultures uh, based on federal law and based on potential kinds of dilemmas that could arise uh, regardless of where you work. Um, what I would be interested in at, at the end when I hopefully leave enough time for some questions and discussion is for those of you who work in Native uh, settings, communities, or treatment programs that you can posit some scenarios where uh, traditions or cultural um, norms might impact the way you think about um, certain ethical dilemmas. So I'd be interested to hear from uh, you as uh, participants um, on questions around that. Um, so the, the beginning of this presentation will cover 
42 CFR Part 2, and I'm not going to kill you with details around the privacy law, but I wanted to give an overview for those of you who might not be as familiar with it and make you aware of some of the amendments that were passed by the uh, legislature last year uh, that changed some of the requirements for 42 CFR. Um, let me move on here so I don't get uh, off track. Kate, how do I move the slides? Oh, sorry about that, Bob. <laughs> Never um, mind. I figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, lots of experience in the field, but I'm still uh, technologically challenged. So again, the overview is for 42 CFR. And after I, I go through some high-level kinds of things around the privacy law, I thought it would be interesting to look at particular kinds of ethical dilemmas that can arise as a result of following the privacy law as it's written. And um, I just threw out, in the end you'll see this, but I just threw out some potential scenarios that you could find yourself in or possibly you have found yourself in. Um, and I, I'll, I'll be happy to give my opinion about how to, uh, ha how to handle those kinds of situations. Okay. Um, I thought maybe Kate would cover this stuff, but uh, it's a, a little background on uh, the National American Indian Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center. And just that the views of uh, my views, in other words, uh, aren't necessarily the views of SAMHSA or HHS. I, I wasn't blaming you, Kate. I was just uh, saying I wasn't prepared. Um, Sorry, thank you. I guess this is... Um, <laughs> Some of this content is what we cover usually in our in our intro, but it's um yes, it's 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 kind of been stated in what I already said, but um I'll, yeah, I'll just I'll just let people know that what this slide is too that we um the purposes of our trainings is to uh, is to help the workforce um, be more equipped to work specifically with American Indian and Alaska Native clients and to also train um, people of that community to be working in their own communities um, to, and to uh, support the work of trainers and educators, clinical supervisors, and um, future leaders, as it says here. And, and so, sorry about that, Bob, but uh, thanks for um, cluing me on those. Sure, I think, Kate, there's a couple more slides along these lines. Uh, nope, sorry, you're, you're relieved. <laughs> All right, 42 CFR Part 2 and Ethical Considerations. So just quickly, 42 CFR Part 2 is the federal code of regulation that governs privacy regulations for addiction treatment programs that receive any federal dollars. And 42 CFR Part 2 has been in place since the 1970s, and it's the highest uh, or the most restrictive privacy law for healthcare uh, that we have. Uh, so if you follow HIPAA um, guidelines for privacy, uh, for, for privacy policies and, and operations in your facility, you, you really you need to look beyond that to 42 CFR Part 2 because it's much more specific, much more restrictive. And um, whenever you have two laws that are both intended to do the same thing, you follow the one that's more restrictive. So in this case, for addiction treatment or substance use disorder treatment, it would be 42 CFR Part 2 if your program receives any federal assistance. Again, this applies only to federally assisted programs, this particular law. Part, part 2 protects information that would identify a patient either directly or indirectly as having an SUD or substance use disorder or having been at, or being or having been a patient in a federally assisted SUD program. And when they say uh, um, identify a patient, uh, oftentimes what, uh, what I've run into is that even, even if um, somebody's just calling a loved one or a police officer or somebody's just calling to see if somebody is in your program, obviously you're not allowed to tell them without a consent form. I'll get into that more, I guess. <clears throat> uh, 
So a written consent is technically the only, uh, by the client, is technically the only way you can release any information about the person, including their presence in the facility. That applies to law enforcement, it applies to the legal system, it applies to family members. Uh, where that differs some is uh, state by state with respect to uh, minors. Um, some states will provide the same protections to minors that adults have. Other states uh, have slightly um, uh, different uh, uh, guidelines around that that might require you to contact a guardian or a parent. Uh, it depends on your state, so check, check the state law around that. Redisclosure of client information is prohibited. So if you release information uh, to another entity, they cannot re-release it without consent. I believe HIPAA law is slightly different there, where HIPAA has in their disclosure statement uh, that you can re-release information once it's provided to you, but you cannot with this particular law. There's a couple of good sources for you to, to reference, so you don't have to, uh, you don't have to uh, look through piles of paper around this regulations. One is the Electronic Code of Federal Regulations, and you, you can simply Google what I put here on the slide, and it'll bring up that Electronic Code of Federal Regulations with an index, and then you can look for a specific area that you're unsure of or you want uh, more information about. The Legal Action Center is also a good source for understanding this law and for understanding the amendments that were made in 2017. And they provide these, uh, they provide these summaries that are easy to read for, for lay people like myself, where you can understand the law more easily than reading the, the legal jargon that's in the actual law itself. It, the things that are, uh, I would point people towards understanding better are the, are the um, uh, is the language around court orders and subpoenas and how those can be obtained by law enforcement. Um, I'll get into that a little more later, but that, that section is important to understand, as are the consents and what's required in a consent form. I believe, I believe the, um, the Electronic Code of Federal Regulations also provides a sample consent form, so it shows uh, what needs to be in the content of a consent form to make it valid. <clears throat> in, the, in the amendments that occurred last year, the federal government looked at this law and decided it needed to be updated since when it was written, there were no electronic records. And um, also with the intention of making addiction treatment records more easily shared uh, with other healthcare providers uh, in, this, in this climate of integrated care and coordinated care. So one of the things this restrictive law has done, obviously, is it's made it more difficult to share client information with other healthcare providers, just by virtue of how uh, restrictive it is. In the new amendments that were passed last year and went into effect, I think, in March of 2017, on the consent form, the to whom section allows more options, where uh, think of it in terms of um, you're working with several different agencies to serve the same population, right? Um, and you want to have the ability to uh, share client information with those different providers, uh, uh, case managers, peer support services, um, uh, people that work with the homeless, and et cetera, or, or medical care. You can put in the to whom section all of my treating providers and have that be an option for you to use so that you can communicate with all of that client's uh, treatment providers. Now, I, I believe you have to um, offer specific, the, the other option is to, to also offer uh, specific options for the client to select. So that's not the only option, <clears throat> excuse me, they have to choose from. But the point is you, you can uh, Make this a broader consent form when you need to and when the client's willing to do so in, in order to communicate with different uh, healthcare providers on, on their behalf. The account, or I'm sorry, amount and kind of information to be shared must be explicitly described in the information to be disclosed. So it's okay to say all of my SUD records, but you also have to have options underneath that of specific elements of their record that they could share if they wanted. You can't just have all of my SUD records as an option on the consent form. 
Again, these are changes that were made, amended in the, the last version of this law. <clears throat> Qualified Service Organization Agreements, or QSOAs. Many people aren't familiar with these. There are agreements between the addiction treatment provider and another program that also offers um, services that benefit that client population. So as an example, um, here in Minneapolis, we have a detox center, a withdrawal management program that wanted to form a QSOA agreement with another program that offered peer recovery support. What this allows for is those two programs to share information freely about the clients they serve. Uh, but both programs are held under this 42 CFR Part 2 uh, under these uh, regulations. So whatever contract or is an agreement, whatever agreement an addiction program has with another program, that other program becomes bound to following the uh, regulations under 42 CFR Part 2. There's more information about QSOAs on the Legal Action Center uh, website, or you can search for it on Google. But that's an option for addiction treatment providers to use in order to work with other programs that offer services they don't offer and to share, and to share private information freely between the programs. The intent of it, of course, is for continuity of care and more comprehensive care for people includes electronic health records. One of the new things that the law has uh, included this time is that if a client requests a list of all of the entities that you've released information to, you have to provide that to them. It can be in writing or an electronic form of some kind, but you have to provide a list of all entities you've released information to uh, related to that client and a written notice of confidentiality rights has to be provided to every client upon admission. I think probably most programs do that already. Um, I'm just reading over this to see what time. There's exceptions to this law, and those exceptions are built in because sometimes circumstances dictate ethically, uh, and for the client's care, you have to release information in order to, in order to uh, either help the client or to report a crime. So uh, in general, as I said before, the only way you can release information to anyone is with a written consent. But there are three exceptions, four actually. The first is a subpoena and a court order uh, signed by a judge, and it, this has to be in relation to a serious crime, and there has to be no other way the courts could get the information without going through your program and getting access to the client. If, if a law enforcement officer comes to you with a proper subpoena and court order, the court order is not sufficient in and of itself to, for you to, to compel you to release information. You need a subpoena in order to compel you to release any information. So the, the two things have to be together. And it has to be in relation to a serious crime. And there has to be no other way the courts could get the information where law enforcement could get the information without going through you. If all of those conditions are met, there's more to it than that. But if those primary conditions are met, then you can give law enforcement access to the client. Otherwise, if somebody shows up at your door an officer or a judge calls you or a lawyer or probation officer calls you and says, I know this person's in your facility and you need to give me access to them. Uh, you can't even acknowledge the person's there without these documents that I just mentioned. In, in addition to that, um, warrants and uh, search warrants and arrest warrants are not sufficient to even acknowledge, for you to even acknowledge that a person is in your facility. Those, those are not sufficient means for law enforcement to gain access to your client. The reason this law is in place, part of the reason this law is in place to begin with is to uh, prevent law enforcement or the legal system or employers or anyone else from discovering that people are in treatment. It's, it's intentionally preventing people from finding out. 
Uh, a lot of this has to do with the stigma and the potential harm that could be done to somebody if, if anyone had access to them. So the law isn't written intentionally to make it difficult for law enforcement to find out if somebody's in your facility. The, the reason for that is if it's uh, easy for law enforcement to find out that somebody's in your facility, those people with legal problems will never go get treatment because they'll, they'll figure they'll be uh, uh, caught and arrested, right? So the idea behind this law is to protect people very carefully from uh, being discovered uh, from law enforcement. And that means even if law enforcement knows they're in your facility, you still can't acknowledge that. There is one exception to that. It's if you know the person's not in your facility, you know they're not, you can tell the police that this person is not in our facility. But you can't tell them if they are there. Um, I understand there's obvious, uh, <laughs> there's obvious uh, implications of that, but let me move on. So this just kind of reiterates what I just said. Another, the first bullet point. The second bullet point uh, as an exception is if there's a medical emergency and that client needs some immediate treatment, then obviously you can call uh, 911 or first responders and get that client help and provide them with whatever information they need in order to treat the client. Uh, the, the, the final um, uh, exception has to do with crimes committed on the program premises. So if a client uh, commits any crime on the, pro on the program premises, you can report that without consent. Uh, somebody destroys property, somebody uh, assaults somebody else, even the threat of that technically could be reported to law enforcement without a consent. In child abuse uh, or state laws, I, I, I check with this on with your attorney, but uh, state laws around child abuse uh, um, likely apply regardless of um, privacy law, but I would be careful around that. Uh, you don't want to report somebody who you suspect of child abuse and violate this particular privacy law. There needs to be some um, clear indication that that's occurring, and that's up for uh, you know discussion as to what that means. But I would just be careful about reporting people for child abuse um, without having a pretty good uh, case to back that up. You know, reason for violating the law. So the purpose of going over all of this again was to show that there are some ethical dilemmas that can arise as a result of uh, following the privacy laws it's written. Real quickly, I wanted to show you though a few, uh, just, just a real quick overview of uh, codes of ethics and the general principles that most codes of ethics contain. Um, always consult with somebody at your, at your organization uh, if you're an organizational leader, um, you know, have, a, have an attorney on speed dial. But there are some ethical considerations that I think all of us would struggle with. And it's always good to have uh, either a supervisor or someone versed in law and ethics to help guide us in these decisions. So um, it's tough to make some of these decisions on your own when there's some very complicated kinds of uh, situations that can come up. So just touching on ethical principles, this is from the APA. Pretty basic things I'm sure you're all aware of. Uh, do no harm kinds of uh, principles, fidelity, make sure your ethical considerations uh, are uniform and, and don't uh, favor one person over another. Uh, just the integrity of um, how you apply ethical decisions, social justice kinds of issues that are uh, implied by ethical decisions. Uh, and, of course, a re a respect for people's rights and dignity. This slide provides some links to um, codes of ethics that you could review. Um, again, I think most of you are probably, I don't want to kill you with specific uh, discussion on ethics. We don't have time for it today. But these codes of ethics, I think, all contain those principles that I just mentioned. It won't surprise you any. I don't think there's anything um, that's tremendously different from one code to the other. Iowa file, file excuse me, Iowa follows the International 
Certification and Reciprocity Consortium, the ICNRC um, guidelines. So that, that would be for Iowa anyway, um, the kinds of rules that would apply. Again, they're phrased differently, but basically say the same thing. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, the presentation, I, I, I would be interested in knowing specific kinds of uh, differences, if there are any, for tribal, tribal communities or uh, tribes in respect to how codes of ethics are written and specific elements of codes of ethics that would be substantially different. Than, or, or add to some of the things I've already mentioned. That would be helpful to know um, for me, and it would be something I could include in future webinars to be more specific uh, to the traditions and, and uh, cultural values of Native American people. Overriding rule of ethics is to keep people alive. Um, so do that. <laughs> and. Where it gets tricky, though, and, and I'm not saying don't keep people alive, but where it gets tricky is in is in, in the details of when somebody is in defining when somebody is in danger of harming themselves, when they're in danger of harming others, um, and then also with a, a, a duty to warn when when that applies. The reason I say that is because I have seen instances where staff people counselors and paraprofessionals have made a determination that so-and-so is a danger to themselves and we need to report them without a consent form. And in further discussion with the client or examining the, the situation more closely, it's not apparent that that person is in Im imminent danger of harming themselves. Um, so it really requires some careful considerations around you want to protect the client, obviously, but you also don't want to violate their privacy law or their privacy by reporting them and violating the, the 42 CFR conditions. So always err on the side of protecting the client. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying that uh, further, in, further um, Investigation sometimes reveals that there isn't an imminent danger to self or others. It's just if you have the ability to and the time to, it's worth looking into before reporting somebody without their consent. Uh, the duty to warn issue is also something that can be confusing for, for some people uh, who, who take that to mean that anytime there's a threat, I need to report this person. Um, the specificity of the threat has a lot to do with when the duty to warn applies. And I, again, would refer you to, to lawyers and, and people in your own agency to make these kinds of determinations. But from my perspective, if there's a specific threat to someone, that say a client is making a specific threat against someone, uh, and I'm going to hurt that person when I leave here, then it would be, uh, to me, that would be a reason for warning that person, obviously. If a person says, I'm, when I get out of here, I'm going to blow up the city of Minneapolis, that obviously wouldn't be uh, a reasonable kind of duty to warn. Who would, who would you call and is it reasonable this person would actually blow up the city of Minneapolis? So, I mean, those are two ex kind of extreme examples, but oftentimes the duty to warn piece falls in the middle there where it's less clear is this an actual time when I should warn somebody, or is this a general threat that the person likely isn't going to follow through with or couldn't follow through with? Keith, should I just stop for a second, see if there are any questions? Or Oh, I see one. Yeah, it'd be great to. Oh, sorry, Bob, I was just going to say. Um... It would be great to take a break here and, and take some questions, and people can submit those in the Q&A or the chat pod. Um, as I said before, if you want to be anonymous, you can sit a, submit it in the Q&A pod. Um, the chat pod can, you can, you know, feel free to submit comments at any time, and and that, that's just a great way to be interactive throughout the, um, the webinar today. So 
Yeah, Bob, why don't you go ahead and take that question? Yeah, so I, I didn't mean to exclude. The question is, what about the NASW Code of Ethics? I, I wasn't trying to exclude any particular um, professional group's Code of Ethics. There's the National Association of Social Work Code of Ethics. There's the Public Health Code of Ethics, NADAC, uh, a variety of them. I, I didn't mean to um, exclude any. I, I was trying to, I guess, make the point that most of these codes of ethics contain similar principles and similar guidelines. Not identical, but similar. So that, that was my only intention there. And it was due to the, the time limitations we have today to go in depth. I was going to point out in upcoming slides some particular codes of ethics uh, from NADAC that apply to uh, confidentiality uh, in particular, just to emphasize that there is a connection between ethics and privacy. And you are welcome, Franny. Okay, um, additional sort of high level uh, thing, uh, areas of ethics to be aware of is never use the client for your own gain. Um, and I already said this, I guess, but just just be uh, 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 communicate well with <laughs> supervisors and others around ethical dilemmas that you may be faced with, and help help think through it with uh, with other folks. So we're not making these decisions on our own because it can be a really uncomfortable position to be in to, uh, to find yourself making a decision about something that you're not sure of. I'm not sure that sentence I just said made sense. But. One of the principles under NADAC that it has to do with confidentiality I've highlighted here. I just took it, I believe, from NADAC. So if that's changed, somebody let me know. Again, the point is, my point is to show that privacy is uh, very much connected with um, ethical decision making. And oftentimes, this, these are the, the most difficult kinds of dilemmas to uh, sort through. I believe, Kate, I believe everybody gets a copy of the slides, so I, I wasn't going to read through the. I hate reading slides. So <laughs> if it's all right, I'll just move on here. And hopefully everybody has a copy so they can review this later. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is more of the same, but it's principle eight of NADAC's Code of Ethics. Oh, one point here, though, I wanted to make. Uh, a lot of people think that if a client signs a consent form to somebody or some organization that you have to release information because the client said it was okay to. It's not true. If a client says, uh, I sign, if a client signs a consent form to, uh, I don't know, some other provider, and that provider calls you and says, I need that information. You as a professional, though, think, I'm not sure there's any real reason why this provider needs to know this information. You have the, you have the ability to decide on, the, um, on what's in the best interest of the client and what you should release that that, um, that person needs or that organization really needs. So in other words, you can, you can be the gatekeeper for uh, information that goes to other providers based on what you think they need to know and what's in the best interest of the client. So even if the client signed a consent form, it doesn't mean you have to release that information. If the client tells you to and says, I want you to, um, then obviously you can do that. But the point is you have some discretion in terms of what information is released. And um, that comes up more often than you think. Uh, uh, I've, I've seemed to, to get the impression from counselors I've worked with over the years that believe that if there's a consent in place, they're, they're compelled to release that information. And um, you can be uh, selective uh, as long as it's in the best interest of the person and it's the information that the place needs, not everything under the sun. If there are state and federal laws, uh, local county laws, or local, uh, well, be state or county, I guess, um, and federal laws, if they, if they conflict, the federal law should take precedent over state law in, in terms of privacy. So if there are state laws that are more flexible, less restrictive uh, with respect to privacy, 
like I said at the beginning, you go with the more restrictive law, and in this case, the federal law would be, in most cases, the more restrictive. Always go with the more restrictive privacy law. All right, let me move on here. Uh, just quickly, um, I wanted to mention that the, uh, the client should, as a part of both ethics and privacy, uh, the intent to, uh, what, what are they called? Um, oh, I can't think of it. Um, making sure that clients are informed of all of their treatment options when they enter the facility. Somebody help me with the name of that, um, that uh, form or that process. Um, <clears throat> I'll think of it. But well, this has come up, uh, especially uh, recently with opioid treatment. Whenever somebody enters a program, they have to be provided with all of the treatment options available to them, even if, even if those are treatment options that you as a program don't provide. So if somebody comes to your program with an opioid use disorder and you don't provide, say, medication-assisted treatment, but you know of other programs that do, you have to provide that client with information about those other programs that provide MAT. So they have that as an option. Informed consent, that was the thing I was trying to think of. So there has to be informed consent for clients. So they come into your program, they're seeing, okay, this is what you offer, but here's what is available to me in the larger community. That makes sense. Oh, there's an NASW Code of Ethics mentioned. ACA, APA, uh, MADAC, and more. It's a quick, I know that's a quick review of it. ethics, but I'm, I'm guessing that most of you have had ethics trainings, have gone through ethics classes in school, and are familiar with the basic principles that I outlined. Um, if you have specific questions or you want more information about codes of ethics, I guess you would contact uh, Kate, but I, I could help get you that stuff. I wasn't trying to um, gloss over anything here. I just wanted to get to what I thought would be an interesting discussion in the last section of the webinar here. So um, this is where I... Uh, I came up with some potential ethical dilemmas that might involve privacy and client well-being. And I was interested, I hope, I hope you respond with your thoughts. Um, I was interested in walking through these and then leaving a little time for maybe some discussion or questions that you might have um, or anything I didn't explain well. I'm just posing these to you as potential scenarios. You meet with a client that tells you he, has involved, he was involved in a series of robberies, some that involve serious assaults, in order, in order to obtain money to buy drugs. The client said he was never caught and laughed at the fact that he got away with it. The question is, what would you do? You know this person, uh, or at least they've told you that they've committed these serious crimes, never got caught for it. They're laughing about it. And you're sitting there as a clinician saying, do I have an ethical obligation to report this person to law enforcement to make them aware of the fact he committed these crimes? Most of you are going to probably already know the answer to this. The answer is no, you can't. You can't report that person to law enforcement. Unless they did any of these things while they were on your program premises, you can't report them. So. The, the, the dilemma that comes up with clinicians is that that, uh, you know, that moral obligation to do the right thing. And the right thing might seem like, I need to make somebody aware of these crimes, right? This guy hurt somebody, or this, this woman hurt somebody, they robbed people. But the, if you follow the, the privacy law as intended, uh, tech, you, you can't do that. You, you, by law, cannot do that. You can make comments and write comments to me as we go through these, if you like. I'll try and respond to your questions. Here's another one. A police officer arrives at your facility late at night with a search warrant and demands that you let him or her in. The officer says, I know the person is here. 
you know, as we uh, discussed earlier, a search warrant is not sufficient for an officer to gain access to, the, to your clients. It's also not sufficient for you to even acknowledge whether or not that person is there. What I've had to, uh, what I've done in the past when I've been faced with this kind of situation, a, a police officer shows up at the facility, bangs on the door and says, I have a search warrant here. I want to see this client. I know they're here and you need to let me in. The way I would respond to that, and I'd suggest you respond to that, is to say, I can't confirm or deny that person's here based on federal privacy laws and then provide the law or cite it and say, based on 42 CFR Part 2, I'm not allowed uh, to acknowledge whether that person's here or not. And they will fight and argue and, and threaten to arrest you for obstruction of justice and all kinds of stuff. Um, they had never have arrested me for this. They usually leave angry, check with the lawyer, and then I never hear from them again unless they come back with the proper court order and subpoena. What I would tell my staff to do, though, is I would say, do all of those things, cite the law, don't give them uh, any client information, or uh, acknowledge whether or not the person's in your facility. But if they threaten to arrest you, um, give them the information and tell them that you believe they're violating a federal law rather than get arrested. I didn't want my staff to be thrown in jail um, simply because I was adhering to a particular law. So if it were me, I would take the risk. I didn't expect my staff to. Um, but it's a situation I'm sure many of you have come across. The, the way to respond to that should be kind of rehearsed so with the staff, I think, so that they, they know how to respond in those situations. Because typically it happens at 9 o'clock on a Friday night. And, uh, you know, people, people don't know quite how to how to handle it. I've gotten those calls a few times. So uh, example three, a client gets in an argument with another client out of anger and frustration. One of the clients picks up a chair and throws it at the TV in the lounge, destroying the TV. Yes, you can report them to the police and uh, it doesn't require their consent doesn't require their consent to do so. So if there's a crime committed on the premises, you can report that person. Someone just walked in my office accidentally. <laughs> Sorry about that. Another example, a client reports to you that she murdered someone in her hometown five years ago. She was never caught. She states that this haunts her. This is a tough one, and I've actually come across this kind of thing before, too. By law, by law, I couldn't report this. Um, what I did do, as an example, was talk to the person about what it would mean if she turned herself in and uh, went to the authorities. I didn't, I didn't um, uh, tell her she needed to, and I didn't tell her she had to, um, but because it was such a serious incident and because uh, it was obviously uh, affecting her and because legally uh, it would probably be the best thing for her to do. But by law, I couldn't report that. And that's a tough one. But that does happen. Unless the crime is committed on your program premises, you can't report it. without the proper court order and subpoena, et cetera. I had just quick, I, I don't mean to ramble, but I had a situation where many, Minneapolis uh, Violent Crimes Division, like five guys with guns and everything showed up at my office and they said, we need to interview someone that we know is at your facility who uh, is being investigated for a murder. And I had to tell them, I can't tell you whether or not that person is here. Uh, it was uncomfortable, but they what they did was they went and got the proper court order, the proper subpoena, and they came back, um, and they were able to gain access to that client. Uh, the system worked. It took them about two, maybe three hours to get this accomplished. And um, in the process of doing that, um, we 
we adhered to the privacy law and we also uh, ensured that law enforcement was able to do their job. Uh, and, uh, second to last example, the police arrive at your facility with a court order signed by a judge. I probably already answered this one. Court order is in reference to assault and battery. The police are requesting that you confirm the client is at your facility and arrange for them to take the person in custody if they are. So that's pretty much what I just described uh, happened with the Minneapolis uh, Violent Crimes Division. Just to reiterate this point too, if you know somebody is not in your facility, you can tell the police that. So if this violent crimes unit showed up and I knew the person wasn't there, it doesn't make sense to have them go through this whole process of getting a court order and subpoena. And by law, it's acceptable to say that person's not in our facility to save them the time and effort of looking and getting the documents in place. Now, when I mentioned earlier, there's some implications of this. The implications are Law enforcement learns pretty quickly that if you say, I can't confirm or deny that person is here, they might be there, they probably are there. If you say that person is not here, obviously they're not there. <laughs> so if you put two and two together, the police pretty quickly is, uh, figure out that if you say, I can't confirm or deny, uh, likely the person is there, but they haven't signed a consent form. So in this, this case, a client has a seizure and requires medical care, but hasn't signed a consent form to, you know, the hospital. Uh, of course, you're going to call the hospital and get them the care they need. Happened a lot uh, when I ran a detox center in uh, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, and client seizures and all kinds of medical emergencies, heart, heart conditions, all kinds of things happen frequently. Um, of course, we're going to call 911 when that happens but we only provided the information they needed to treat the client. And I already answered this question. I spoiled it for you. So I'm gonna, this leaves about a uh, uh, little over 10 minutes uh, for a little discussion. I hope we can have some. But the goal of confidentiality is what? It is protecting, I think I answered it. Yeah, protecting the client. Goal of ethics is protecting the client. Well, that's not the answer that uh, was on our previous PowerPoint. It was protecting the profession. I think that's the right answer. If you disagree with that, let me know. That's the primary goal of ethics, the overarching goal. I would say protecting the client is probably a, probably gets you a, a passing grade too, but. So please have questions. Um, I hope I didn't put you to sleep. Um, if there's anything I can uh, help or if there's anything you can offer to the discussion, that would be appreciated. I have one question. What happens if a client discloses he has been sexually abusing his stepchild for five years? Uh, uh, can you report this? Again, I'm overly cautious about um, any instance where I'm, I'm breaching uh, confidentiality law. But in this case, I would say, just just based on the question, I would say there's pretty good uh, there's pretty good reason there to uh, report the person, especially if they're living with their uh, stepchild, and that's an ongoing. A concern. So I, I think um, what, what can help you though a little bit with situations like this is as a clinician anyway, make sure that when you meet with people you, you remind them that you're a mandatory reporter of child abuse so that they know if they tell you this, it's not, uh, it's not uh, a protected information necessarily, right? So um, gives the client uh, uh, some ability to use discretion with what they want to tell you because they know you've told them up front, hey, if you tell me this stuff, I have to report it. Uh, it's one of the few exceptions where you would have to do that. So 
it's worth mentioning up front with any client that you meet with. That's a tough one. <clears throat> Come on, somebody else asked me a question. There we go. Oh, thank you. We'll wait just a minute or two. Yeah, well, we're waiting for any more questions to come in. I'll um, just note, uh, um, Bob mentioned earlier that, yes, these the handouts of these slides are available. You can actually download them in the files pod below the, the presentation screen. Um, but I'll also be emailing out to them out to anyone who attended. Um, and we also send out a link to the recording of today's webinar. So if you want to um, listen to it and watch it again, um, if you want to share it with colleagues, um, that will be available um, as long as we're around. So um, that is something you can also do. And we, yeah, as, as well as that, we do have a, um, a survey that we'll actually, we'll actually uh, send you over to on your browser um, as soon as we close out but I'll also send the link to that in case you don't get redirected there. Um, so just watch for those emails to come in and, and you'll see um, the handouts and the, the follow-up information there. Since there, there doesn't seem to be additional questions, Kate, I'd, I'd just like to make kind of a closing uh, a comment um, that I think is important. Is that all right? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, part of my uh, interest over the years has been in looking at how both the treatment, both the, the healthcare system and ethics are typically based on on values and um, traditions of, and, and beliefs of the dominant. And by dominant, I mean the 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 culture in control of things. I'm as a middle-aged white guy. These the treatment system, the uh, healthcare system, um, is very. It, it's based on people like me, right? And, and it's geared towards serving people like me. And what I've been interested in over the years is how do we adapt uh, both behavioral health and the healthcare system to uh, various cultural beliefs, various cultural healing practices, traditional kinds of healing. How do we make it flexible enough so that people of other cultures can feel like the system they're entering is um, attending to, to their understanding of the illness, right? There's an area of, there's an area of anthropology called medical anthropology. Medical anthropology looks at how various cultures view, how they view health and wellness, and how they view illness. And it's a critical thing to look at. Because if I'm serving somebody that's, um, say they're um, Hmong, and they come to my facility, and their, their traditional belief system is such that they view mental health or addiction very, very differently than I would coming from uh, my cultural background we should be able to um, adapt the way we provide them care based on their understanding and beliefs about it. If we don't do that kind of thing, we're very selective about who we're being effective with, um, with our treatment uh, approaches. I think it's really, really important to understand how somebody views their illness or their condition in order to come up with strategies to help them with that condition. Until we do more of that as a system, uh, we're designing Western-based approaches that don't apply to other cultures. And um, what I hope to do, and if Sean uh, Bear was with me on this webinar, he could speak to this more. But what I hope to do in the future, if, if I do a webinar like this on ethics, is to include um, those specific kinds of considerations around my culture views this particular condition as this, therefore, my response to it would be different, right? And help to flesh that out a little bit so that we get more um, inclusive about 
um, about our, uh, maybe I should say more broad in our thinking around health and how different cultures view health and illness. Uh, I hope that makes sense, but that, that's, that's, a, that's a real need in, in this whole system of care. It came up uh, in working with the American Indian Advisory Council a little bit and DHS here in Minnesota, where DHS has a set of billable services that don't include, for instance, um, spiritual healers or don't include any or sweat lodges or any of the kinds of things that might be considered helpful for people trying to recover from addiction who want to connect with their particular cultural um, uh, heritage. And, and I think um, the, the, the obvious sort of um, disconnect there was uh, apparent to everyone in the room, but we don't adjust regulations to match uh, cultural beliefs, and we need to do that. So I'll be quiet. But if there's no other questions, um, Kate, uh, I think I'm out of things to say, and that's probably uh, fine with everybody listening. <laughs> but I hope something I said was helpful or, or got you thinking. That's so great. Thank you for and I, I just would um, uh, piggyback on that and say that, um, yes, Bob and Sean have done this training, um, I believe, as a day and a half training. Is that right, Bob? Uh, by the oh, number of slides, it sure looked like it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is a, an incredibly truncated version. And um, I think we are going to try to uh, work it out in our webinar schedule to have a second um, edition of this in which Sean will speak more specifically to um, uh, cultural adaptations um, and ethical practices as it pertains to, as you've mentioned, um, differences in practices in the culture and, um, yes, inclusion and, and um, in using or utilizing um, spiritual or cultural practices as well. So thank you for mentioning that. And um, we will be um, announcing upcoming webinars shortly um, for the month of July. And hopefully uh, we'll, let you, we'll let you know, but we plan to bring back the um, topic of ethics and go more in depth with um, the cultural side of things at that time. So thank you for mentioning that, Bob. And um, again, thank you for to everyone who joined us today. And um, yeah, I, I, as I mentioned before, I just um, thought it was so great to to have Bob share his experience. Um, it's it's so helpful to hear the specific uh, um, types of situations that might come up um, when working with clients, and it's something that you. Um, you don't get out of a textbook. So I really appreciate uh, you bringing that experience for us to learn from Bob. So thank you so much. Um, and yeah, thanks again to everyone who joined us. And with that, we will close out here and I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks very much.